I'm going to start by drawing a bit of the background and show you how these different rocks get placed into the crust where we find them today. And so as I draw this picture up, you'll get a feel for it. But we're going to speed it up so you don't have to go through me drawing it. When I stop at each section, I'm going to explain what you're looking at. First, let's start out with the continents and how they intersect with the plates that are moving along the ocean bottoms. So remember we had the spreading zones, which bring magma to the surface in the middle of the ocean. And these zones have lava that flows out underneath the ocean and spreads out in the opposite directions these zones intercept with what amounts to crustal continental material, which I'm just going to show as a big diamond here. And then, and then as they intercept them, they drop down in what's known as the subduction zone. That subduction zone is where we get what's known as the ring of fire. Here in California, we have earthquakes on a regular basis. In Japan, they have them. All around the Pacific Rim are these earthquakes and volcano areas that are known as the ring of fire. Those are basically where the subduction zone goes underneath the continental crust. And that's where our story begins. Let me draw the rest of the picture and then we'll explain as we go along. So while I'm drawing here, take a look at what I'm going to draw. We're looking at kind of the Earth's surface and this is volcanoes and subduction zones combined with the magma underneath the Earth. The continental crust floats on top of this, this magma because it's lighter. Also, as the transoceanic ridges spread out, that's kind of a conveyor belt, it'll eventually dive underneath in the subduction zone, underneath those continental crusts. All this gives us rise to volcanic or igneous materials that find their way out onto the surface. Buried under these are certain kinds of deposits that contain traces of gold, sometimes concentrated gold in load form. All of this basically is stuff that's going to eventually show up in the creeks and valleys and rivers that you will go prospecting for placer gold in. That's where it concentrates after the rains and all these other things. The secondary vents with water and silica in suspension, actually not in suspension, it's, it's under the right conditions that it's like molten glass. This material pushes up and carries with it a charged load of metals. These metals will precipitate out under the right conditions, the right pH and the right electrochemistry that's going on. They'll plate out just like a just like a metal plater shop, and they form crystals inside those inside those quartz veins. And as the water vaporizes out and leaves the sulfides and the crystals behind. Uh, what ends up happening is a concentration of gold crystallizes out or silver or a mixture and you get these fantastic gold veins that are very very rich in the metals whereas normally the material in the magma is not all that rich in gold it's there but it's not that rich but when you get these other effects going on it concentrates the metals for example if gold goes around a corner in quartz it can actually create a piezoelectric effect and cause a, a, a plating, a differential crystallization of that gold in one direction or the other. And that's an important aspect of knowing where to go look for gold when you're looking at a gold load or a vein deposit. So hydrothermal deposits are a very important aspect and we'll be talking a bit of that, about that when we get to looking at rocks and how they're built. When we look at fractures and fissures and see things that get injected in when you get a mixture of these things going on because no rock is as simple as one type of rock all at once. Typically you'll find conglomerates and mixtures and, 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 and whole grades of qualities. These are very important to understand when you're looking at a system to determine what it is you want to go looking for. You may find an area that has a lot of interesting looking colors and 
rich yellows and reds and, 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 and dark, dark, almost black browns. And that would tell you something about the kind of mineralization that you're looking at and the kind of crystals and minerals you're looking for as well as the kind of rocks you're looking for. Once you start finding those rocks, then you start knowing where it is you want to specifically start prospecting with your pan. And then once you start finding things and pulling them out, you know the material that you're finding, then you can decide what kind of mineral, uh, what kind of mining equipment you want to bring in. Uh, large mines are built on microscopic quantities of gold. And it can be very rich in terms of the effectiveness of pulling that gold out, but not very rich from pulling it out with a pan. But if you know what you're looking at, you can have it assayed and determine whether or not you're really dealing with something of wealth, something that actually has a viable mineral value. And if you know that, you can find that, that claim that you have could be worth millions. So it's important for you to understand where you're going with your prospect, what you're looking for in the way of rocks and minerals, and how to tie that story together with your map, with your claim, with your hydrology and geology. All these things we've been talking about come together in a picture. We'll be talking more about that in the course. But right now, just understand, you're developing a picture as you go along. That picture tells you where to go look next. And that's the story of how gold prospect. It's not something you do just by luck. It's something you do by science and art. You need to understand and get the skills going. That's why we're here.